everyone. Um, welcome uh, to uh, our roundtable. Um, I'm going to hand you over to the uh, moderator, um, George, in a second, um, but just a couple of housekeeping sort of issues before we do. Um, so I can see that um, a lot of you have joined us uh, without your cameras on. Can I please ask that the very minimum everyone within uh, the roundtable does put their cameras on? The idea is to sort of engage with one another. Um, if this obviously wasn't a virtual event, um, then you would at least be face to face um, on a round table. So if you don't have your cameras on, can I please ask um, that you do turn them on now? Um, otherwise, I'm going to ask you all to, to turn your cameras on. Um, anyway, so I can see that there are sort of looking at my screen about five people that don't have their cameras on at the moment. Um, you know, if you can, please you know, turn them on. As once again, this is a round table in order to sort of at least talk to one another. So um, as an, if nothing else, as a courtesy, um, please ensure that your cameras are on throughout. Um, so just for everyone's uh, reference, the round table um, that uh, you have all joined today is Roots um, to Securing Public Funding for Longevity Startups. So if you thought you were joining another round table, then um, this is the one that you've joined. Um, it, I appreciate none of you have come here to listen uh, to me. So I'm actually going to hand you over to um, the moderator for the um, session, George McGuinness. Um, he's going to introduce himself and then he will introduce um, sort of broadly um, the sort of speakers that we have. I use that term um, broadly because you know again we want everyone to participate but uh, we just have a sort of a couple of pre-prepared sort of discussion points that hopefully everyone can jump in with if you do want to ask a question um given how many people are participating um i suggest that you either put it in the chat function at the bottom um of the uh, zoom bar um you know do it to everyone so everyone can see the question um or alternatively there is a raise hand function um which just means that your hand will effectively get raised onto your icon um so for those of you who have just entered day David, Walter and Nicholas, if you can please turn your cameras on. Um, I am going to turn my camera off um, and I'm going to hand you over um, to George. So George, over to you. So Becky, thank you very much um, and good afternoon. I'm George Pierce. I'm the Challenge Director for Healthy Ageing at UK Research and Innovation. Uh, and uh, as Becky said, I'll, I'll be moderating the session. Um, and just to um, introduce the, or let the um, other speakers introduce themselves. Um, I'll do that one by one and they'll say something about their, their perspective. So Rachel, why don't you kick off? Thanks, George. Hi everyone. I'm Rachel Carey. I'm Chief Scientist at Zinc. For those of you who haven't come across us, we run a venture builder for individual entrepreneurs who are pre-team, pre-idea and who are passionate about solving a particular societal problem uh, through a new product or service. So um, improving the quality of later life is one of our four mission areas around which each of our programs are based. So we have a portfolio of uh, later life ventures, tackling a whole variety of different problems in that space. And we're also working with UKRI on their Healthy Aging Catalyst Awards, through which we're supporting 60 academics over three programs to develop uh, innovative and scalable solutions. So we do a range of work and run a range of programs around healthy aging. And one kind of common area, unsurprisingly, that we support our ventures on is funding and investment. So supporting teams to secure the right type and level of funding at the right time. Um, so here today to share a bit of our learning and experience from having supported ventures on that journey. And then maybe Ian, if I could ask you to go next. Yeah, sure. So Ian Newington, I'm Head of Special Projects at the NIHR's Central Commissioning Facility, sitting in the innovations team, uh, which involves, uh, looks after programmes like the i for i uh, program which is about devices diagnostics digital technologies we also uh, manage the uh, AI award uh, platform for NHS uh, England and H NHSX uh, and are running some of the early phases phases of that uh, competition um, and um, so I'm kind of here as a representative of public funding particularly in the in the more clinical space and translational space uh, and uh, I guess representing the, the, the wider NIHR as well in that context. Lorraine. Uh, hello everyone, it's lovely to be here. Uh, I'm Lorraine Morley from Age Tech Intelligence. Uh, ATI was established in December last year to build on the work of a five-year EU-funded programme called the Age Tech Accelerator, which supported innovative age tech businesses from across Europe. Uh, we help organisations understand the age tech market. We help businesses pilot and test products and services. 
uh, and we also introduce promising businesses to buyers and investors. And to finish, I should probably add my own perspective from UK Research and Innovation, um, massive UK government funder of research and innovation. But the Healthy Ageing Challenge that I lead is a £98 million investment aiming to enable people as they age to remain active, independent and socially connected across the generations for longer. And we are going to do this through a number of mechanisms, which we'll go through, but um, uh, supporting startups and creating a sort of healthy pipeline of innovation is a big part of the way that we think. And I think sort of with, with that in mind, I'm going to sort of open the conversation. We'd like to sort of take the conversation on a journey through from what you can think to the actual sources of funding. So you get the context of what that is. On, on the way, do please can, um, raise your hand or, or filter questions um, into, into the chat function. So starting by thinking about how you set off on a funding journey, let's, uh, for the panel, say that you're approached by someone who says they're looking for funding for their idea. Um, what advice would you give someone who's just starting out on their innovation journey and that clearly shaping that that case for funding um and maybe ian if you um nhr charles yeah of... <laughs> sure no absolutely and i uh, i in fact i've been talking to someone that's just this morning already who's in that exactly that kind of position it's a very common uh, situation and i, and I guess the, one of the first things i want to try and ask the question is do they do they understand actually what where they are in that journey already and, and what what they've actually got so trying to un unpick exactly what what where they are what, have they got a proof of concept have they got a prototype what, what exactly is it still on paper or is it an idea in their head so understanding that uh, position and and then also uh what's the evidence that they got something which might somebody might think is useful so have those kind of conversations and then um, I guess the first thing to say is, yes, we can talk about funding, but I want to know about the team. What sort of team have you got? Have you got the right expertise to what, what are you trying to do? Where, where's the next step in your journey? And, and I'll be asking them as well, I guess, a, a few key people that can help them to identify the route that they need to take to get where they think they want to get to. Uh, and things like um, quite a commonly, I'll be asking, have, you know, if it's a medical device for instance and they need regulatory approval have they talked to the mhra uh, and uh, and similarly um have they talked to nice not and, and quite often i find the reaction to that is always way too early for all of those things but actually it's never too early because it's much better to get that early and it's free at that point advice about what you've got where it's going the, the journey that you're going to need to take and the evidence you will need to collect to demonstrate the, val the validity and the value of what you've got um, because if you go the wrong way, um, certainly as a public funder, I'm concerned that you're spending public fun funding money, public money, and uh, you end up in a place where you actually then have to go back to the drawing board and start again and respend money to, to do the same thing because you've missed something critically important. So, so I think it's understanding where they are and what the journey is they need to go on. And then we're getting to think about, think about support and identifying other places where they can get support. But I think we'll come to that a little bit later. So getting an understanding of your innovation journey, the one that you're setting off. Um, Lorraine, you do a lot of work on helping people understand the context within which they're going to enter a market. Um, do you want to say something more about, uh, about what you found? Yeah, absolutely. And we've been looking at this market for sort of five or so years, researching it quite deeply. And I hope we've got some information that will help people kind of understand what they're coming into and where they might kind of go. And then some advice at the end about, um, you know, how to, um, uh, you know, how to kind of situate your product and establish its value. So uh, the age tech market or silver economy, as we, as it's formally known, feels like a relatively new market, but big businesses are like, Easy Link and Tunstall and Apello has been supplying solutions in some form for a very long time and still to some degree dominate the scene. Um, but around 2014, we saw a big leap in interest in the age tech sector from startups with three times the number of businesses entering the market compared to the previous 10 years. It was a very busy period. And this interest continued over the period to about 2017 before slowing down with fewer startups entering the market since 2018, at least according to the research that, that we've done. Um, this may be because uh, they've been pushed out by, I suppose, as the big global brands actually have joined the fray. And you'll know that 
advert, you know, you think of any brands that uh, are obvious to you and they're all thinking and looking at the opportunities that this market represents. Um, I mean, to give you an example, from 2015, we've been aware of more than 300 innovating businesses and startups entering the UK market in, uh, sorry, entering the market in the UK alone. And our international database has details of more than 1600 innovating businesses from 42 countries. Uh, most of the business models we see are targeted at the informal carer as the payer or the self buyer. Um, but just to give you some idea of who's doing what, I looked at my database this morning, actually, uh, and in the UK market, we know of at least 75 products that are helping old people keep in touch. Um, we saw an explosion of those during uh, lockdown last year. Uh, 68 are helping people uh, manage memory care or, or dementia. Uh, more than 70 businesses have products uh, which are mainly apps uh, tracking well-being, uh, and more than 100 are trying to help old people stay active and maintain uh, maintain social activities. So these are all areas that are actually quite busy. There's quite a lot going on. There's quite a lot of competition, um, but there's only a handful that are helping manage. Uh, things like, you know, continents, maintain personal hygiene, help sleep quality and assisting with sight and hearing deterioration. And these are all things that really start to chip away at someone's independence um, uh, uh, and start to affect whether they can kind of live a very uh, kind of, um, uh, well, live the life that they want uh, and work in retirement and end of life planning at other areas that represent opportunity. Um, just a little bit about the kind of sector uh, generally. So age tech businesses are very diversified. On the innovation have... journey you're on. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, sorry, I think my connection has gone unstable. <laughs> Oh, OK, fine, no problem. <laughs> so age tech businesses are very diversified and have to operate in quite a, a complex uh, uh, market environment, which is very risk averse often and which has a demand side. So those that want to buy products, which often, and this is quite important, they often require evidence that a product or service will work with a specific demographic. So most buyers or commissioners, certainly in the public sector or in the social care sector or in the care sector, um, want evidence of what works well for what type of users under what conditions and for how long. Businesses that have the most success are those that fully understand the problem that their product or service will solve. And this is another important in, uh, point that's come out um, to us is that they, you know, they want to fully understand the problem that their product or service will solve and where there is no obvious or long term workarounds because humans and, you know, we're very, very good at finding workarounds for things, um, you know, value propositions in those successful businesses or products are often very uh, clear uh, to the buyer or the user too. Um, it's particularly important not to design and create this market in isolation. Uh, so get out into the real world early on. And uh, Ian was alluding to this, and I'm sure Rachel will agree as well. But get out into the real world early on, include users and buyers from an early stage. Use your wider network. Do not be shy. Um, don't pass a key development milestone without checking product market fit with real people in a real environment and trial or pilot your products and gather the data and evidence you need uh, and if possible create some use cases. Lovely, I'm going Listen to hold to you there Sir Lorraine and, and um, um, just, just to sum up, so two important aspects, one is really um, understanding the, the journey that you're going on um, and the evidence you need. But, but um, Lorraine's also really pointed out, really understanding the competitive landscape. That burst of innovation three years ago is just one example. The burst of innovation actually last year as well shows that you're probably not the only person who's thought of this idea. Um, and it's really important to understand um, who's out there, why it either worked or didn't work and, and therefore position your, your innovation. So. Let's let's sort of move the sort of thing on and, and think about gathering support. And um, Rachel, I'm going to ask you to start off. So what sort of early stage, what, what should early stage ventures focus on in order to position themselves well for any kind of funding? And Lorraine's already given us a couple of ideas, but particularly what are the kinds of things that Zinc encourages at your ventures to do? Yeah, it's a good question. And I think the reason it's a helpful way round to come at this is that focusing on the right things for your product and your venture should it doesn't always feel like this but should always be also be the right things to position yourselves well for funding whether that's grant support or investment um, 
so a lot of the usual things you'll hear um, from inter advice from different funders, but maybe just highlight three things. The first, as Lorraine has um, touched on, is product. Um, so is there an inspiring, fresh vision of a solution that has the potential to be effective at tackling an important problem, but that is also engaging to end users? And I think that's a, a critical balance, which many of you will um, know the pains of trying to get right. Doesn't matter how effective something is if it's not engaging um, and vice versa. So, so is there a kind of inspiring fresh vision? And then we look a lot at productivity and progress. Lorraine touched on kind of real world experimentation and user research, conducting pilots. Um, so we put a lot of emphasis on that kind of testing early assumptions uh, quickly and safely working with partners, which we can come on to in a bit. So I think focusing in on the product and really prioritizing developing and testing that in the early stages is key. Second thing is evidence. Again, um, Ian mentioned this at the start. I think this is for us, a lot of this is about not having to try and reinvent the wheel, uh, but drawing on the wealth of knowledge and data and published research and expertise that exists. Um, and sort of knowing the knowns and unknowns, understanding the foundations you're, you're standing on, including where there are gaps that you might want to contribute to, which can be a good way to position yourselves for research funding, because you may well be contributing to an evidence gap. Um, I think there is a need to sort of shift a little bit away from what can seem sometimes like a kind of all or nothing, full clinical trial or nothing type binary um, way of thinking and, and thinking about your own research roadmap and, and internal evaluation strategy. What are you measuring for your own product as you go along um, and kind of having a rationale for that is key. So so second thing is evidence. And, and I, as I said, I don't just mean kind of uh, large scale clinical trials, but your own kind of understanding of what metrics you want to capture to make sure you're on the right track. And then the third thing and final um, piece to highlight for now is, is around team and partners. So having a kind of a quality and complementary team, but also an advisory group and, and partners that are well placed to help you tackle the problem you're interested in. The key piece of advice, I think, again, won't be a surprise to many of you that we give is to build those relationships slowly over time. Um, and I think when a funding opportunity then arises, if you've got the right partners around the table that you've already started speaking to, it's much easier to start collaborating around um, collective proposals rather than starting from scratch. So, uh, yeah, we would we would look at evidence, at product, at team and partnerships and a whole bunch of other things that you probably know. But those are some um, some things to get us started. So really interesting message in, in the conversation we had before this this session was about the importance of other forms of capital so I don't know um, Ian if, or, or Lorraine if you wanted to sort of um, add in something so before you start looking at funding what are the other sorts of things you should be gathering together? Yeah no absolutely I think uh, and, and I, I mean Rachel's covered quite a number of those things and I think it's team is important I think uh, and we'll perhaps come on to this with public Think about actually accessing funding but your team is just as important to, to, to the public funders as it is to the to a venture capitalist uh, they're looking at the team that you've got and what you'll find is once you, the further down the journey you go the the more sets of skills that you require you don't need to have have to employ all of them but you need people that you can access whether it's through a contract research organization or uh, a consultant or uh, some sort of partnership with an academic group so there are there are you need to think about what what skill sets you need and where you're going to get them from um, and, and and realize that you this is not a journey you you're likely to be able to do past that initial perhaps that initial stage of having the idea and even then you need to talk to lots of people around that idea before you can validate it so so you need a lot of other people to help you and I think that's one of the that is definitely one of the critical things uh, I would say um, and the other thing is I think uh, is is find a champion for your tech, your idea uh, if I'm talking in, in the, if it was in the clinical space, particularly, um, you know, if you're trying to sell into the NHS, for instance, you're going to, we're going to, I would be telling you to go and find a clinician who's going to use this stuff and who really gets what you're doing and is, is, is going to make the case for you. He's going to work with you as well to help you with your clinical studies and, and evaluation, but, but they're also, he'll, he'll also be a champion. He'll be selling that to his, 
his own hospital trust and probably to his colleagues in other places. And that those people are really critical. And that's true, whether it's a, someone in a local authority in a social care situation or, uh, you know, it, community nursing or whatever it is, whatever, wherever your idea fits, you need to find that person who's going to be an advocate for you, who is sufficiently independent from your organisation, but, but who's, going to be, who's going to really sell it for you. I think that, 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 that's a great point of that broader. Sorry, Lorraine, you come in. Yeah, I was just going to say that um, it's also really important to learn how to talk about your what your product or service does in a real in a real world sort of way so that when you're talking you know to an investor or a funder you can kind of contextualize things so you can use a tool tools like uh, something like the ADL life curve some of you might have um, come across that or look at the life coursework that's been done by NHS England or even Maslow's hierarchy of needs and just show where your product or service sits what it's really the difference it's really ma making to people in kind of their day-to-day -day life whether that's an individual or someone who uh, is in a care home or someone who's receiving social care so kind of pinpoint where your product is and talk about it in a way that uh, puts it into kind of yeah that explains it in the real world so we've talked about a lot of support and that's actually uh, could be quite bewildering um it'd be interesting just to sort of pick up on the role of um and there's all sorts of words for these sorts of things incubators accelerators organizations like zinc um, organizations like Unlimited in, in the social enterprise sort of space. Um, how important are they, um, do, you, uh, do you think, in terms of um, enabling some early stage innovators to get their case together for funding? I'm, I'm going to pick up Lorraine again because you've, you've actually had a broader sort of view, view of the market, haven't you? Yeah, and the uh, two audience, do please chip in after Lorraine's had, had um, uh, said her piece and, and give your view. I think accelerators play a really important role, but they work for certain types of um, teams, I suppose, and certain types of individuals. I mean, for me, the main value of an, uh, of an accelerator programme is the network that it opens up. Uh, and the opportunity to get constructive feedback on, uh, on a proposition, um, but also the willingness to do something. You know, people have to be willing to do something with that, um, with that feedback. Uh, and a business has to be ready to be accelerated because typically the purpose of an, uh, joining an accelerator is to cram 18 months of development activity into about three months. And that can put a lot of pressure on the business. But if you've got the right mindset, you've got the ambition, you listen, you take advantage of the networks, um, then they can be a really uh, solid way to get your product close to market very quickly. And to help with funding, because you've got this kind of evidence base and this credibility behind you. Yeah. Now, and I think your point about getting the right accelerator, because many of them have very specifics of aims and purposes, um, is good. Um, Ian, I'm going to sort of pick on you a new, new question, but how important is um, getting the right sort of university partner um, involved in all this? Yeah, I, I, well, and again, it, it can be, and I think... Uh, it, it's a challenge, uh, and I appreciate that. Working, if you're in a, if you're a small company or a startup, to, trying to work with universities, the timescales operate on a very different. You know, people operate on a very different timescale in those contexts. So, getting the degree of urgency, but I, but there's a number of reasons why you might want to work uh, or collaborate with a university. One of those is actually expertise. So, you might just need somebody who's sufficiently expert in in a, in part of your area, just as for an as an advisor or a consultant, almost. Uh, or, or to be on your kind of uh, scientific advisory board or something of that nature, you may also want somebody who's actually going to who's got some skills in in their and expertise uh, to actually be a partner with you in developing something or that helping you to evaluate what you've got because they that is the sort of skills you uh, you you need. Um, and, and absolutely, there there almost certainly is going to be somebody uh, in a university context who can help you. Um, it's, it's not necessarily an easy way, an easy thing to find the right person. Um, and I and I think I come back again to something that Rachel mentioned earlier on, and that's because I and I wrote it down on my on my notes for this thing uh, several times actually, and that is time. So you know, time is money, right? So we're talking about uh, just a moment ago about extra capital. Time is a really important thing. You, you don't want to rush these things, whether that's and in fact, it's almost impossible to rush them. To build a partnership that's actually going to work and deliver what you need it to do is almost certainly, except for you know, 
uh, I'm going to say love at first sight, you know, those, sometimes those relationships, you find somebody and it just kind of clicks, but that doesn't happen very often. Sometimes it takes a while to build a relationship, to find out what it is you are looking for, for to help them translate what you're, what you're trying to get, what you're trying to do in, into a language which they can understand and you can have that conversation. And, and it's worth taking time over. I, uh, one of our, um, in the NHL, we have a group called the Research Design Service, a little bit like KTN is as regards Innovate. Uh, and, and one of the things they do is they go around and they help people form partnerships. And, and one of the guys I worked with on that, he said, he, I saw him speak at a meeting I was at uh, and he, and he said, you know, be realistic. It takes six months to put together a team to do uh, this. We're talking much a slightly more translational level of, of, of work in the clinical space, but he said it takes probably about six months to get your, the right team together to form the partnership. That's going to be stable enough. That's going to understand what they need to do and have all the pieces in place. So don't, it's not worth rushing it. I think that's quite critical. Um, it, but there are places you can go, and we're, we're going to touch on it, I think, a little bit later, but there are some people that can help you, including NIHR and KTN, to actually help uh, to access some of these people who might have the right expertise, who can help you, and who'd be willing to help you. And Rachel, you, um, obviously Ian have stolen a little bit of um, what, what you said earlier, but um, you're helping people on these journeys of making those partnerships. Um, anything to add? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with everything Ian said. So I lead Zinc's research and development team. And a lot of our role is to be a sort of human bridge into the academic world and, and facilitate those types of relationships, a bit like the kind of role of university um, engage, um, enterprise and commercialization and TTO teams, um, but kind of on the startup side. A couple of things to add. Um, I totally agree about building those relationships kind of slowly over time. Um, I think the key question is what you want from those partnerships, being super clear about whether it's, um, you know, the brand of the university, whether it's a particular type of expertise, whether it's a kind of hands off advisor, whether it's a collaborative research project, the nature of those partnerships, you need to be really clear about up front. And, I think we've the, the kind of most successful partnerships we've facilitated is where there's been an opportunity to sort of test the relationship through a reasonably small scale project. Um, and universities will often have in-house funding for those types of uh, translation or collaborative projects through, for example, impact acceleration accounts. Um, and some of our, our ventures have, have benefited from having some kind of opportunity to test the relationship through those small scale projects before going in for some very um, formal, very large research grant. But there are other um, ways to engage as well, including, for example, you know, MSc student placements or having a kind of uh, advi academic advisor on your board. I think it's just about being really clear, is this sort of consultancy? Is it a collaborative research project? Is it a once off discrete project you need a bit of input on? Is it the kind of overarching reputational brand of the university? Having those conversations up front, I think, is really important. And that's a great question just come in from Claire Robinson. Before I sort of ask that, I'm going to sort of um, just Mark Elliott, just picking on 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 your sort of title. I'm guessing you've got some experience in this space. So once um, once I've posed the question from Claire, I'm going to come back and see if you've got any sort of um, observations to add to, to what we've been saying. Um, and what, what Claire is, is saying, Rachel, is um, time to build relationship is important, but often competition grants have a very short time frame. Um, really difficult to build up. Any tips that you've seen in terms of chasing the grants as they come? Yeah, so um, I'm about to say something that contradicts the last thing I said, because <laughs> uh, it's good to be consistent. Um, so I have seen cases where having a particular grant call has been a good way to kind of accelerate conversations with a prospective partner. Um, and even if that particular grant hasn't worked out, it's been a good way to kind of get conversations going in a, in a way that has direction and momentum and a deadline. Because as someone was saying earlier, these things can take time and, you know, times, timelines and incentives are pretty different. So while I do think in general, if you have the luxury, it's better to build relationships over time. I've also seen it happen where having a particular deadline in a couple of months around which you can mobilize a community of collaborators can be useful, even if that's not that doesn't end up being the grant that you secure or, or work on together. Good, no, thank you. 
And Mark, did you want to come in and say anything? Or um, you'll be on mute. Sorry, it's that it's that Zoom thing. <laughs> I'm on mute and I'm also deaf, so I'm working with assistive technology as well, which is, um, I always forget. But it's been interesting so far around the table that we've been talking in generalities. And actually, it really does depend on, from my experience, on what from the design council, from uh, prototyping, accelerated working with Arthritis UK, and now on Startup School for Seniors an eight-week program for people over 50 to start their own business, get a plug in there while I can. It really does depend what you're trying to achieve as to which bits of whose comments make sense. So if you're trying to take a new piece of science to extend the quality of life for um, a particular cohort of people, then um, there will be a, a funding route that is well known. And therefore, three quarters of the comments that we've heard today aren't actually relevant for you. And it's very difficult in an environment like this to, as a participant, seeking funding to find your way through what are the relevant types of funding for a business like mine so if that that's just a, a comment and i was going to ask for anybody's opinion about how could we could get funding with with impact reports and all this kind of stuff but from 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 an observer thing i've done some research for um uh, access to finance research for uh dcms uh for small scale businesses between two and 50 million so i have some experience of this but it, it, it what you've heard may not be relevant to you out there you out there not the expert people but you if you're founding a company looking at a space it may not be relevant for you uh, I, I think that's that's a great point mark and 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 i think that goes back to what we were trying to say at the very beginning which is really getting to understand your innovation journey um but you've also done a great segue to what i think is is the next piece which is um actually securing that public funding um and um what you should be thinking about when looking to to get funding um and i'm sort of going to start by saying something myself about why governments fund startups so um, our work in UKRI on, on startups is really focused on driving economic growth by working with companies to de-risk, enable and support innovation. And in the case of my specific work in healthy ageing, aligned to a strong mission to support a wider policy objective. So that's what government's trying to do. And on the way, we're looking for additionality. Uh, so asking the question why this can't be done solely with private sector funding. So that gives you an idea of some of the questions we're going to be asking when you start to um, come and, and apply for, for funding. And there's quite a broad array of different types of, of public funding, uh, ranging from government grants, um, which have some sort of limitations around um, how much of your project can be funded by the government because there are sort of international trade competitive rules, there are some routes like public procurement through the Small Business Research Initiative, which would give you 100% funding if, if, if you're going to meet a very specific government objective. And, and um, Ian might be able to say more than that. Um, we've got investment partnerships where we're trying to solve that gap between what you can get from the government and what you need for your project by partnering with private investors um, in, in a partnership that will have certain um, implications. And actually, if you're through, if you're beyond the startup, there are also things like innovation loans coming in, which are which are more directed towards scale up. So um, open question really to the panel, how do you choose and what behaviours do these different sources of funding drive? Um, 
any views on on choosing between that that vast array Ian, okay, so it, you're yeah, responsible it's, for a, quite a broad range of them yeah it, it's it and it is it is very tricky and it's and it's an incredibly complex landscape out there of, of what's going on and and uh so it's so it's certainly in the clinical space there's there's a there's an efforts by nhs england and the accelerated access to try and at least produce a uh a, a kind of sink well a, a supposedly a single front door i use that term a, rather cautiously um uh, to actually get you into the process i think what what effectively what you need and i think mark touched on this is is your journey is your journey and and exactly where you need to go and how you need to go and what funding you might might be a bit appropriate for you is is, is likely to be to, to a degree quite specific to you or may, there may be some particular things that are very much more associated with you what you need is a helpful navigator and there are a few of those around so i'm going to say ktn is if you want to find out what's available to start with even before you know what what they actually do and how they might help you just go and see what's what's actually out there uh there's a couple of places i would re generally recommend where you can see a lot of the stuff that's in the health care and health and social care space altogether ktn is one of those uh, places because they they accumulate pretty much everybody's all the grant funding bodies most of the grant funding bodies into one place uh, and, and then secondly probably the uh, the academic health science networks also the innovation exchange uh, central they have quite a good uh, um, a set of, of, of grants uh, put, pulling all those things together but it, it is really finding someone to help you and there are people like that so go and talk to KTN come and talk to somebody like me somebody from the NIHR if you're if you're in our kind of more space uh and and, and if and even if you come to me and, and you're not in our space i'll point you somewhere else so i think find some friendly navigators to help you find your way through that um it, uh, you're absolutely right there is a certain um and there's different ways different ways of choosing there's uh, that you have to remember with grants there's a success rate and even if you have the greatest idea you may go, be going into a competition where the, everybody else has fantastic ideas and they they end up getting scored higher than yours um and it is competitive and there's only a certain amount of money so you may be uh, you it's probably a um not a wise idea necessarily to build your entire business plan on on getting a particular grant because the chances are there's there's a limit to how much you can get there so so or the chances of that are, are slightly smaller um it's worth saying that in general i would experience suggests that uh, specifically scoped themed challenges tend to be uh, slightly less competitive than uh, broad open calls. So if you're, I'm going to say Innovate UK, if you're applying for a smart award uh, in, in a space, there's, it, it, it's effectively um, response mode funding for anything that fits in the remit of the program. Um, and actually, lots of people would apply to that with all sorts of things. And generally, the success rate's probably a little bit lower. And that's certainly true in NIHR funding. When you've got themed calls that are very specifically scoped, generally speaking, the success rates are higher, the chances of you getting funded if, if that's where you are in that space. Well, it doesn't guarantee you funding, for sure, but uh, it's a challenge. Yeah, and I think that's really realistic. Um, I was going to, um, I'll come to you, Lorraine and Rachel. You, um, Zinc, obviously help um, startups try and find innovators. So what are the sorts of factors that you've found are really helpful for them to understand the, the pluses and minuses of different types of, of funding? Yeah, I want to echo what Ian said. Um, our experience would very much chime with that, that kind of specifically scoped thematic calls have been um, more uh, have, we've had more success or our ventures have had more success with those probably compared to the wider open calls um, and they've come at it from different directions so some that are doing something kind of technologically innovative so a few who've applied for robotics grants for example some that have looked at it from a kind of population or problem perspective so particular kind of um, uh, demographic groups um, or some that are looking at kind of place based or stage based funding. So thinking about, you know, innovating or running a pilot in a particular place. Um, some of the things that we tend to hear um, in terms of uh, lessons learned the hard way. I think um, one of the main things I highlight is to make going back to what we've talked about already, make sure that it is um, genuinely meaningfully uh, needed and useful and relevant to what you need. For your product or venture at that time and not a distraction um i think it's it's pretty it's easy to to kind of fall into the um the mindset of sort of maneuvering your product or venture to fit a specific grant call 
And I think that's a real risk if it kind of is misaligned with where you ultimately want to get to and the goals you're trying to achieve. Um, I think the some, some of the other uh, advice that we would give and also uh, have heard in terms of lessons learned. So um, tends to take more time than you think it will. Um, there's an argument that a lot, once you've done, for example, Ian mentioned the Innovate UK Smart Grant, once you've done an application, you have a kind of reusable set of resources. And that's true. And it does encourage you to think about things in the right way, but it is also extremely important to tailor your application specifically for the call. So actually the amount of stuff you can just translate is limited, I think. Um, and um, it is an iterative process. It is a skill. Grant writing is a skill in its own right. That's why you see these, you know, organizations like Grantree and Grantify. Um, so you will get better at it over time and, um, and learn from mistakes and learn from the feedback. Um, and I think, as Ian said, don't count on it. Don't build it into your cash flow plans, because um, I think it is uh, it is risky to do that. Um, and the more kind of specific and targeted you can be looking at calls that are really tied to your own interests. I think that's really um, that's a good strategy. Good. And Lorraine, so you want to come in? Yeah, I just uh, I think it's fair to say that to get to new product or service to market uh, always takes more, always costs more than you plan for. Uh, and that overall, the journey is um, kind of uh, generally um, un, uh, complicated and chaotic. But I was, I've was i just been talking to a bunch of businesses about their funding journeys, specifically actually over the last few months. And I don't know, this is all anonymized data, so I'm not giving anything um, confidential away here, but I didn't know whether it was worth me quickly just going through the funding journey of one of these particular businesses, if that would be of interest to anyone. Well, why don't you, yes. Yeah, okay, so, so keep that to sort of um, a couple of minutes, Lorraine. Yeah, yeah, it won't even take that, I don't think. So, oh, um, so yeah, so this is a piece of technology that uh, uh, aims to help people communicate in a very simple way, also um, helps people track their kind of health and uh, uh, well-being. So this is just their general funding journey. So this had one original founder who put in an initial cash injection uh, of about £15,000. They won, then won a startup competition, and that gave them another about £30,000. Um, they then uh, got family and friends to invest in the business and that brought in about another uh, 15, 20, uh, 15 to 20,000 pounds. They then brought another two additional founders in. They brought some cash into the business. Then they got seed funding from two VCs of about 300,000 um, pounds. Uh, then they won uh, two UK, uh, Innovate UK loan competitions. OK, so this is giving you an idea of this interesting kind of convoluted funding journey. Won two UK uh, loan competitions um, uh, and then they raised uh, um, nearly two million uh, through an equity, uh, equity uh, raise. Um, they won another Innovate UK competition. Then they went on to get bridge funding to go from uh, their seed round to Series A. Um, and now they're just looking for a growth round of about six million. But I just wanted to illustrate there how it was, is that there's been a real combination of funding from personal funding, from family and friends, from grant funding to equity funding to get this business to where, uh, to where it needed to be. No, and, and I think some really important points. So, so one of the things that we look for um, uh, and the courses about it are um, pejoratively called grant junkies. Um, and so the point that Cynthia has made in the, um, in the chat, really important to understand your funding journey and, and where you're going to um, be able to sort of become self-sustaining through your own or private finance. Um, but, but also that journey that um, Lorraine's just illustrated, there will be points on the growth journey where the innovation is eligible for further grant funding um, to, to broaden the, the, the portfolio. So really understand and, and need to articulate when you're applying for funding where this funding will get you on your, on, on, on your innovation journey and, and, and when, you know, particularly what evidence it will create to allow, allow you to be um, uh, sort of equity funded or, 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 or attract other, other forms of investment. Um, so I think that's... Um, been really good. We're very close to time. Um, Ian's done an excellent job of highlighting some of the sources um, that you can 
go to for um, advice. Uh, in particular, sort of, uh, he's highlighted the, the KTN um, who have an access to finance service, um, the academic health science networks, uh, whose mission is in part to, to build a bridge between you as innovators and the academic world um, in, in, in healthcare. Um, Claire has also um, in the chat pointed out that Innovate UK Edge also have a business advisory service role and, and, and there's lots there. Um, if you're a university um, or, or recently from a university, don't forget your technology transfer offices. Uh, and in particular, um, if you're not a sort of um, science, technology and engineering based innovation, those offices are, are often not well known to your to your departments and your perspectives, but could be really valuable sources of information. Um, so lots of things and support. So things like the NHS Clinical Entrepreneurs Programme, there, there's, um, we obviously run um, a catalyst program for innovators in, in, in the longevity field with Zinc, and we'll have another call for um, researchers who, who want very early stage funding. Um, Innovate UK also has the iCure program um, around the country. So lots, lots of support there. I think the other interesting point that's really come out through this is really understanding what are the conditions and what are tied. So we haven't mentioned EU funding. Most of that comes with a requirement to collaborate um, with other EU countries and build multi-country. A lot of Innovate's funding comes with a requirement to collaborate with a university and show that you've got access to leading expertise. So use those advice services to understand what different grants, what different funding mechanisms offer and, and how you can get to them. So um, we're nearly on time. So I'm just going to sort of open up to the panel for some closing remarks. Anything that you want to sort of add um, before we go? Um, Ian, but, I think. Yeah, you know, just, just, just one. Uh, just, I mean, just one thing actually occurred to me. It was sort of partly through Mark's comment on in the chat. Um, and I actually don't forget small pots of money can be when you're a small, uh, the smaller stage can be really important. And actually, your local enterprise partnership. Uh, you know, local authorities, local organisations in the space where you are have grants of, you know, a few thousand here and there can to support you in certain things, more of more the sort of administrative processes that you're going to have to run office space, renting, all of those kind of things. It's very well worth checking those out if you're in the locality where you're where you're based, if you have an office uh, base in particular, some of those some of that funding can keep you going for a few extra months where you might need that time, which we talked about before, to, to think about getting those partnerships together to actually uh, I, I get some ex extra money. Lorraine, anything you want to add? Sorry, you're on. Yeah, just that, you know, there's a bit of resilience and creativity needed in fundraising and things. And sometimes it's not the most obvious um, uh, routes. Uh, I was talking to someone that said that they got a kind of recharge back from one of their uh, suppliers of, I'm just looking at it here, actually. I can't, uh, I'm trying to find, anyway. Uh, just be creative. Sometimes you can find uh, ways of bringing in revenue or cutting costs while you're on your funding journey that might not be the obvious ones. Mm -hmm. Rachel. Um, yeah, I think uh, I was going to say something similar to Ian that this is not public funding specific, but a lot of our ventures have um, successfully secured small grants from charities or foundations uh, or local authority partnerships or and relationships with specific NHS trusts, for example. Um, and I think those can be really useful. So um, our ventures have had uh, funding from the likes of Nesta, Paul Hamlin, uh, Welcome. On the point about having a specific thematic call, one of our um, ventures, Tandem, which is uh, looking at, at transport poverty, have had grants from the Department for Transport and uh, strangely, the European Space Agency. Um, so there is um, there's a real range out there and it's worth it is almost a full time job to keep an eye on these grant opportunities as they come up it's worth dedicating real time into that. The last thing to add is just it is always worth trying to reach out to people that have successfully applied for the scheme you're interested in. Um, I think you'd always be surprised by how willing people are to share their experience and their reflection and their learning and that's partly what we try and do in the kind of community at Zinc is try and maximize that exchange of learning. So don't don't be afraid to reach out to people that have successfully secured the funding you're looking for either. 
Good, as well. Um, forced to me then to, to wind up to thank um, the panel for um, some, some amazing contributions. Uh, thank you as the audience for joining um, and for contributing, in, uh, particularly in the chat with some of the questions. And for those of you that are setting off on a startup journey, really best of luck. Uh, do use the support that's out there. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, you know, everyone's pretty much said it. So thank you for joining us. Um, you know, I hope you enjoy the, the rest of uh, longevity and um, hopefully we'll uh, speak to you all very soon. Thank you so much.